when the Pacific War erupted, a unique ship was unexpectedly embroiled in the most intense naval conflict yet. It was USS Langley, a vessel that had served as a modest collier for 30 years. During the interwar period, the ship was bestowed with the distinction of being the United States Navy's first aircraft carrier. Then, after a thorough reconfiguration, she was ready to consolidate a tradition that would endure for many generations to come, as Langley set the standard for all subsequent carrier protocols. But despite the valuable contributions to her successors, she remained an experimental aircraft carrier during a time when carrier battles had not yet happened. Even so, it all changed in early 1942, when Japanese reconnaissance aircraft spotted her, and suddenly, the possibility of combat was no longer a hypothetical notion. Changing times. USS Jupiter began her life as a collier back in 1912, and was one of four Proteus-class colliers in the U.S. Navy. However, unlike her sisters, which had either reciprocating steam engines or geared shaft turbine drive, Jupiter was heavily modified from the outset. The ship was singled out for a new type of drive, electric propulsion. Jupiter was equipped with two boilers that powered turbines and large turboelectric motors which drove the propeller shafts. This innovation proved to be so successful that the Navy implemented it in six battleships and two battle cruisers that were later converted into the aircraft carriers Lexington and Saratoga. Jupiter's connection with the aviation world began from the start, when she was captained by Commander Joseph M. Bull Reeves, known as the father of carrier aviators, who advocated for the integration of carriers into the fleet. However, World War I broke out, and the U.S. entered the conflict in 1917. The French government sought help from American naval aviators to tackle the U-boat threat. Under the command of Lieutenant Kenneth Whiting, Jupiter arrived at Brest in France, becoming the first U.S. aviation detachment to appear in Europe. By the end of the war, as the U.S. Navy began its drawdown, it became apparent that Jupiter's career as a collier would soon come to an end. The use of coal as a fuel for warships was dwindling, and Jupiter was decommissioned by 1920. Fortunately, the most exciting part of her service was just around the corner. The Covered Wagon Jupiter proved to be an excellent candidate for conversion into an aircraft carrier, due to its spacious interior, which could accommodate fuel and aircraft storage. Specifically, the ship's six coal bunkers were repurposed to store aviation fuel, unassembled aircraft, machine shops, and elevator machinery. The first coal bunker was refurbished to hold 578 tons of aviation fuel, while bunkers 2, 3, 5, and 6 were designed for storing unassembled aircraft and machine shops. Meanwhile, bunker 4's upper half was utilized for the machinery for the flight deck elevator. But when the elevator was fully lowered, it stood several feet above the main deck, necessitating the use of cranes to transport aircraft. The magazine was located just beneath the elevator machinery spaces, and the stacks were reconfigured to accommodate the flight deck, which extended along the entire ship, elevated on spindly steel truss towers. The flight deck covered the bridge and deckhouse, earning Jupiter the nickname the Covered Wagon. For proper conversion into an aircraft carrier, Jupiter was also equipped with arresting wires fore and aft, as well as a catapult. However, the ship lacked an actual hangar deck, and the aircraft had to be brought up from the holds and assembled or serviced on the original main deck. Even so, Jupiter's most unusual feature was undoubtedly her carrier pigeon house, situated between her stern five-inch guns. While it was not uncommon for pigeons to be carried aboard seaplanes for message transport, when Langley released the entire flock while anchored off Tangier Island, the birds returned to the Norfolk shipyard, where they had been trained. Consequently, the former pigeon house was transformed into the executive officer's quarters. In truth, Jupiter's transformation was entirely experimental, and her top speed of barely 15 knots was insufficient to keep up with the fleet. Nevertheless, following her conversion, she was commissioned as USS Langley in March of 1922. The ship was commanded by Kenneth Whiting, arguably the most outspoken advocate for aircraft carriers during the interwar period, effectively becoming the de facto first commander 
of the U.S. Navy's first aircraft carrier. Firsts. On October 17, 1922, Lieutenant V.C. Griffin performed the first ever aircraft carrier takeoff for the U.S. Navy, flying off Langley's deck on his Vought VE-75F. Just ten days later, Lieutenant Commander Godfrey de Courcelles Chevalier executed the first carrier landing, this time on an Aeromarine 39B. The following month, Commander Whiting himself was catapulted from the carrier in a PT seaplane for the first time. That winter of 1922 aboard Langley marked the first time that orders such as pilots man your planes, rig the deck, and stand by to start engines were given aboard any American carrier, establishing a tradition that would continue for over a hundred years. Indeed, Langley saw the first experiments and challenges of naval aviation. For example, Crew members could jump into rigged netting outboard of the flight deck in case of a crash, while hooks and tail hooks were put in place to engage the arresting wires. Additionally, hand signals were developed to direct the aircraft on deck since there were no radios on board. Notably, the aircraft lacked brakes, so a bomb release was developed to allow the plane to turn up to full power prior to the deck run. After several tested techniques, a slow turn and flat advance with the nose high and using power became standard and resulted in several crashes. Then came night flying and deck landing, new ideas to be explored to aid aviation and crew members. Langley could carry a squadron of a dozen aircraft, plus some utility aircraft, but the shortcomings of having just one elevator that also required the use of a crane affected the performance of the entire ship. Moreover, storing the aircraft on a different deck than the flight deck restricted the ship's operational tempo, prompting the implementation of a deck park against British and Japanese conventions. With time, the U.S. carrier's capacity was tripled to accommodate up to 36 aircraft on the flight deck, with room for a handful more below, while the first crew of the first aircraft carrier developed the necessary techniques for more agile launches and recoveries, demonstrating the potential of the aircraft carrier as a whole. Rendezvous Beginning in 1927 and continuing for the next decade, the USS Langley operated off the coasts of California and Hawaii, serving as a training unit dedicated to ongoing experimentation and addressing technical fleet challenges. Then, in 1937, she was sent to the Mare Island Navy Yard in California for an overhaul, which included a second conversion, this time to a seaplane tender. Her career as a carrier had ended but her well-trained pilots went on to crew the invaluable USS Lexington and USS Saratoga. Langley was then redesignated with hull number AV-3, and she soon commenced her tending operations, ranging from Seattle and Washington to Pearl Harbor and San Diego. In the fall of 1939, she joined the Asiatic fleet in Manila, Philippines, but after the Japanese invaded the nation, Langley was forced to flee to the Dutch East Indies. However, the unyielding Japanese advance eventually compelled her to withdraw to Australian territory. Upon joining the American, British, Dutch, Australian Command Naval Forces, Langley conducted anti-submarine patrols around Darwin. She then proceeded to Fremantle to join convoy MS-5, assisting with the transportation of troops and supplies bound for India and Burma. But halfway to Colombo, Ceylon, Langley and her cargo ship, Sea Witch, received orders to redirect to Gillette Jap Java individually. In the early hours of February 27th, the seaplane tender rendezvoused with the destroyers USS Whipple and USS Edsall, assigned to escort her. Unfortunately, the small fleet was soon detected by a Japanese aircraft. Shortly before noon, over 16 Mitsubishi G4M Betty bombers, escorted by 15 A6M2 Reason fighters, approached the fleet. Forerunner The strike aircraft did not release all their bombs simultaneously. Instead, the Japanese bombers dropped partial salvos on the American vessels from a medium altitude. This allowed Langley to adjust her course as the bombs were released, successfully evading the first two passes. However, during the third bombardment, the Japanese altered their tactics. With enemy aircraft covering all potential escape routes, Langley inevitably took five hits from bombs, ranging in weight from 60 to 250 kilograms. Her topside was engulfed in flames, her steering was compromised, 
and she listed 10 degrees to port. As she came to a standstill and the engine room flooded, the order was given to abandon ship. The survivors boarded the escorting destroyers, which subsequently fired nine four-inch shells and two torpedoes at the crippled vessel, scuttling to prevent capture by the enemy. Many of Langley's personnel were transferred to the oiler USS Pecos, which was later sunk en route to Australia. Ultimately, only 232 crewmen were rescued, though the exact number of casualties was impossible to determine due to the chaotic situation with the Dutch East Indies at the time, where at least 24 Allied warships met their demise. In fact, many of those vessels had already picked up survivors from other sunken ships when they were themselves sunk by the Japanese within a matter of days or even hours. Additionally, 31 of the 33 pilots from the U.S. Army Air Force 13th Pursuit Squadron transported by Langley boarded USS Edsel bound for Gillette Jop. But when the destroyer responded to the distress calls from USS Pecos, it met the same tragic fate. Despite her unfortunate end, USS Langley laid the foundation for all modern U.S. Navy aircraft carrier operations. And although she never served as a carrier during World War II, her contributions continue to be relevant more than a century later. Thank you for tuning in to Dark Seas. To keep up with more amazing military stories, please consider subscribing to our channel and hitting the notification bell. And if you're interested in exploring how technology was employed in some of the most brutal battles in history, click on your screen and check out our other Dark Documentaries channels. Stay tuned.